Good morning. Good morning. My name is Bill Ackerman, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today, whether you're here in person or join us online. If you are a visitor and you have questions about McGregor, we would love to talk with you at any time about the church. After the worship service this morning, please join us for a baby shower for the Romani family in Glen Hall. The youth will meet this afternoon from 4 to 5.30 in Glen Hall. The youth advisory leaders will be Sue Ishimori and David Jenkins. Our Lenten book study will Zoom at 4 p.m. this afternoon. The Zoom link is available through the flock note email and the e-messenger newsletter. Easter lilies will grace our sanctuary on Easter Sunday. Forms for Easter lily designations are in your bulletins. The deadline to turn in your form and payment is Sunday, April the 10th. There will be a Monday Thursday worship service on Thursday, April 14th at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Easter Sunday will begin with a sunrise service at 7 a.m., followed by a regular Easter Sunday worship service at 11 a.m. Following that worship service, there will be an Easter egg hunt for preschool age children through fifth grade. Contact Sean Moore or Michelle Smith for more information about the egg hunt. And now let us take a few moments of centering silence to prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
come together now for the prayer of confession as printed in your book. Merciful God, we confess that we have left your side and run off to a far country. We insist on doing things our own way, believing that we know best without relying on your guidance. We have wasted the gifts you have granted us, squandering resources and pursuing selfish ambitions. Turn us around, O oh God. Forgive our sin and draw our wandering hearts back to you, so that we may find freedom once more and rejoice in your love. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old life is gone, and the new life is begun. Beloved children of God, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Thank you. 
Our gospel lesson this morning comes to us again from Luke's gospel, chapter 15. We'll hear the first two verses and then jump down to verse 11. The first two verses kind of give us the context. They tell us who exactly Jesus was talking to. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a far-off country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger? I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen. For all these years, I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me so much as a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, You are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I have to say, last Sunday was wonderful. Dan Holloway emailed me this week and mentioned that it must feel like I'm drinking out of a fire hose, and I confess that at times, yes, it does feel that way, but I am so glad to be meeting you and to start to put together names and faces, and no, I'm not ready for the quiz yet, but I'm getting there. (laughs) Several of you mentioned to me last Sunday that it was your first time back to in-person worship. And I heard others saying that they were seeing faces they hadn't seen in quite a while. This pandemic threw us all for a loop in a variety of different ways. We've gotten out of habits and practices, like getting up and getting dressed and getting to church on Sunday morning. It is something that is such an easy habit to get out of. 
and a really, really hard one to get back into. So pat yourself on the back that you're here this morning, <laughs> especially if you're here two Sundays in a row and it's your first two Sundays back. You get an even bigger congratulations. Sometimes it takes a big event to stir us to action. Last November, it might have been, well, it's our pastor's last Sunday. We really should make the effort to be there. And last week, well, it's our interim pastor's first Sunday. Let's go see what she's all about. Now, I don't know you well enough to know if you were all here last Sunday or not, but I know that others do. And I hope that you know how glad they were and are to see you. Whether you are a recent returnee or you were in the door the first Sunday that in-person worship returned, we all had to make that first re-entry. And I hope that it felt to you like you were returning home, returning to this beautiful, familiar space, to a fuller worship service, more music, the choir singing, the congregation singing, and now singing without masks even, catching up with old friends and seeing each other face to face, not just on a screen, but for real, face to face. And then there are those of you who are perhaps homebound or for whatever other reason, have found that with online worship and Sunday school, you too have been able to return and be included in that way. And that too is wonderful. Whenever and however returning to worship has happened for you, there is something beautiful and exciting and hopeful and tender in this moment. And there may have been some other feelings as well, some concern about what you've missed or if you've been missed, wondering if it would feel the same. And the answer is probably yes and no. Or maybe depending on your health circumstances, concern about whether it's really safe enough for you to return yet. So in addition to the gladness and the hopefulness there's been maybe some anxiety about it too. All of which makes it very easy for us to identify with the younger son in Luke's gospel passage this morning. He too returned home, probably hopeful and somewhat excited, but also concerned. What had he missed? Had he been missed? Was it safe for him to return? All of those range of emotions that we have experienced, I think he probably did as well. For us, when the pandemic hit two years ago and we all hunkered down, pivoting almost immediately to fully online worship, and for some of you maybe just stepping away completely, it was like wandering away to a far off, uncertain and unknown country. For two years, we were at home figuring out what Zoom even was and how to use it and why do I keep unmuting myself unintentionally and how many more times do I have to tell someone you're muted? <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> and some of us felt increasingly isolated and alone out there by ourselves, disconnected. When we did return, that was great, but we were all masked and distanced and it was hard to understand each other and the singing was diminished and so that felt a little foreign too or maybe we found not having to get up on sunday morning and rush to church was a welcome break it was nice to have life slow down and we discovered sundays to be one of the few days that we could actually have a leisurely morning cook a big breakfast, or maybe go out for a drive, or take a hike, or a bike ride with the kids, or just worship from our couch in our pajamas with our coffee in hand. <laughs> You're laughing because that's you, I know. <laughs> it became very easy and very comfortable, didn't it? Whatever it was for you, many of us experienced a taste of what it might have been like for that younger son living in that far off country for a while. Yet I will also note 
That's some of you. Fewer of you for sure because the nature of the pandemic made it so. But a few of you may find yourselves instead feeling a little bit more like the older son in this story. And we all need to be aware of that. Because you are the ones that have been here. Figuring out online worship. Introducing people to Zoom. Picking up extra responsibilities, things you never envision yourself having to learn or do. So while most of us did land in that far off country, some of us stayed behind, doing everything you were asked or could think of that would be helpful. And initially, I think we all jumped into hyperdrive. We thought it was a short-term kind of thing. And we were eager to find ways to connect people and to provide meaningful spiritual connection for our faith communities. I don't think any of us had any idea we'd be maintaining this pace two years later. What started out as a sprint turned into a marathon. And it has been and is exhausting. And if I could, for a moment, I want to lift up the church staff of this church, of every church, really, but particularly this congregation, Karen and Michelle and Joy, and there may have been others of you that I'm not aware of, but they are the ones who have really been in the thick of it. And I know that because I know it's true at the church that I came from. And I know you know that. And just from the little bit of time that I've been here and I have witnessed you appreciate what they do, and you need to know that your love and your appreciation has sustained them <laughs> in these last two years. And you also need to know they're tired. <laughs> and they in particular, and I'm not saying they do, I am not speaking for them, I'm saying I get that maybe they in particular might identify a little more with the older son in this story, feeling a little grumpy from time to time. They love this church, and they love its people, and they love their work, and yes, they're tired. So keep loving on them, keep holding them up, because they really do need it, it's worth it, <laughs> as we work together to navigate some form of long-term, sustainable way to keep doing and being church in this elusive new normal we keep hearing about. And I know they're not the only ones. There are session members, there are other key people in this church, especially in this time since November, that have really had to step up and work hard and may identify with that older son as well. But regardless of whichever son you identify with, and I think on any given day in any given season in our lives, we may identify more with one than the other, that is what we do when we hear this oh-so-familiar parable. We easily put ourselves in the shoes of either the wayward younger son or the grumpy, dutiful older son. Except the story begins by saying there was a man who had two sons. So is it then really about in either of the sons, or is it more about the man who has the sons? Prompted by something I read this week, I actually went and looked up what is the definition of prodigal, which you notice did not occur actually in the story itself, but we do call this story the story of the prodigal son, mostly. The basic definition of prodigal, maybe you know this, I didn't know this, is to be wastefully extravagant, to have or to give something on a lavish scale. Now, if you'd have asked me that a week ago, that is not how I would have defined that word. <laughs> and it does give me pause, however, because we do tend to think of this as the parable of the prodigal son. And to be sure, that word can certainly be applied to him. He goes off to this far off country. He spends everything he has, wasting it, we would say, on frivolous, unrestrained living. We don't know what the specifics of that were, but his older brother certainly had ideas in mind. He devoured your property with prostitutes, is how he imagines it. Maybe. We get a general idea anyway. A prodigal is really not a good thing. It doesn't have a very positive light. But by basic definition, doesn't prodigal maybe apply in a somewhat different way 
to the father of this story. Isn't the father also extravagant and lavish? Some may even say wastefully so. I mean, for starters, when his youngest son, not his oldest son, who would have been in line for the inheritance first, when his youngest son comes and demands his share of the property that will belong to him, he is essentially saying to his father, I wish you were dead. I have no use for you. Give me what I got coming to me now. Thank you very much. That's pretty harsh in any culture, but particularly in that culture, where honor and shame and family hierarchy really had pull and sway. And yet, instead of having harsh words, instead of ignoring his younger son, the father does it. Without question, without argument, without comment, he divides his property between his sons. That demand had to have hurt his father's heart. It must have felt like a ton of bricks or a kick in the stomach. But the father, at least on the outside, does not even bat an eye. He gave his son what he wanted, gave up his property, and probably had to watch his son then sell it for cash in hand so he could trot off to some far off country. That gift to his younger son seems wastefully extravagant, awfully prodigal, at least by definition, doesn't it? And then later, when his youngest son came to himself and decided to return home, not even expecting to be treated as family, but rather as a slave, as property himself, what does the father do then? While his son is still far off, he's been watching and waiting for him. And while he's still far up, he hitches up his robe, exposing his bare legs, which would have been humiliating for a patriarch of that time, and takes off running, throwing his arms around his son, embracing him, kissing him, and treating him not like a slave, but like royalty. Bring the best robe, give him a ring, put sandals on his feet, and let's kill the fatted calf while we're at it. Let's have a party. A big, loud, raucous party. A lavish party thrown for this no good, disrespectful scoundrel of a son who had already humiliated his father once by taking off with his inheritance prematurely and promptly squandering it. That extravagant reception seems a tad prodigal too, doesn't it? And then we learn that this lavish love isn't just for that one son, it's extended to his other son too. When that son learns that his brother has returned and the fatted calf has been killed to celebrate, he becomes angry, resentful, refusing to join the party, choosing instead to stand outside and sulk. And then we're told that his father sent not a servant to order him in, as would be the custom, to come in and welcome his brother. No, the father, who is hosting this party, leaves to go out and plead with his older son. I know this moment is lost on us, the absurdity of it is, but this would not have happened in that culture at all. And when his eldest son then proceeds to mouth off at him in no uncertain terms, the father does not get angry in return. If he is insulted or hurt, which, I mean, who wouldn't be, he does not show it. Just as when he saw his youngest son returning from that far off country, he was filled with compassion, so now he is filled with that same compassion for his older son too. For he discovers that this son, though standing just outside the door of his home, he too is far off. He is far off in spirit. He is far off in heart. And he desperately wants him to draw near. He desperately wants him to return home. Son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. But don't you see? 
Don't you get it? We had to celebrate. This other son whom I love just as much regardless of his behavior. This other son is home. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. What he's trying to say is that there is more than enough to go around. There is room at the table for everyone. Grace, love, they're not like pie with just enough slices and then it's gone. Grace, God's grace and love are abundant, overflowing straight from the heart of God for everyone, for all of us. That, I think, is what this parable is really about. And here's the kicker. These sons are heirs to their father's property. That means at some point, they will be expected to take over the family business, so to speak. One day, they will step into that role of the father. Those of us who have grown up and become parents ourselves know what that transition is like, what it is to become the parent, to love, even when it's painful and hard, to offer grace and compassion simply because we love our children. That is our call as followers of Christ as well. Yes, it is a call to return home, home to the heart of God. The joy we have all experienced in returning to in-person worship is a mere taste of the joy God experiences when we turn around, repent like we talked about last week, and return to God. Receiving such joy, such a welcome as the younger son received in this story, encourages us then to take another step forward, doesn't it? And another, and another, until we are fully at home in God's heart. But the call goes beyond that. Our call is not simply to be receivers of grace, as wonderful as that is. Our call is is not just to return home, but once there, to claim the responsibilities of what it is to be a child of God. As Paul writes, if we are children of God, then we are also heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So the challenge for us then is to live into the family business as well, to live into loving God with all that we are and loving our neighbors ourselves, to become more and more like the parent, to love and be filled with compassion for others even when it's painful and hard, to extend grace even when we don't think someone deserves it or when they don't do things the way we think they should be done. That's the challenge for us, and it's a challenge because it's hard. The thing is, this is an easy parable if we think all it tells us is that no matter what we do, no matter how often we mess up, or how big a mess we make, or how far we wander off, God is always watching and waiting, ready for us to return home, to welcome us and forgive us. We'll take that, no problem, and carry on with the way we're doing things. No change in our hearts at all. I mean, why should we? God's going to forgive us anyway, maybe even throw us a lavish party. Except I don't think the way of Jesus is ever easy. He is never content to leave us as we are. He is always calling us to more. More love, more compassion, more grace, more generosity of spirit, a more prodigal spirit, we might say. Returning home when we are received well is indeed a joyous celebration, and we are, all of us, invited to join the party. But even more, we're called to put aside all our hurts, our disappointments, our resentments, our judgments, our anger. In other words, we're called to put aside our childish ways so that we might imitate and finally become like the one who throws open those big old divine arms and be ready, eager, 
willing, delighted even, to host the party ourselves. So I wonder, who do you know that is in need of such a lavish welcome? We all know someone, or groups of people even. And what's stopping you? What's stopping me? What's stopping us as heirs of God from offering it? Let us trust and know that wherever we are in our faith journey, God is eagerly watching and waiting for us to make that step towards home. And when we do, we will be received with wide open arms. Love and grace poured out upon us in a prodigal way. And having received such abundant grace ourselves, may we learn to offer it, to pour it out on others. Thanks be to God. Amen.
God of compassion, you are indeed slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, welcoming all who return to you with repentant hearts. Even while we are still far off, you are watching and waiting for us. Receive in your loving grace all who come home to you. Tend to our restless hearts, for we know that we are restless until we find our rest in you. Oh God, you call us as your people to pray for the world and those who live in it. And so we pray for your church, your church here and throughout the world. Guide us as your people so that we might be witnesses to reconciliation and to peace ambassadors for Christ in the ministry of reconciliation that you have given us. We lift our prayers for the nations of this world once more, O oh God. We long for peace where there is war and violence, for an end to oppression and fear, for a world where justice will be tempered by mercy. We continue our prayers for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, for all throughout the world who are not watching the news from the safety and comfort of their living rooms, but are daily living the fear and horrors of war and violence. Merciful God, we pray for the planet, the earth which you have given us, we pray that all might share wisely the resources with which we have been blessed, not squandering or wasting them, but gladly sharing them so that all may know abundance. We pray for those who are lost, those who are still far off, for those who are estranged from their families, for those who feel estranged from you, O oh God. We pray that we might all come to know the lavish joy of love's embrace and the peace of homecoming and of welcome. Merciful God, we pray for those who are sick, those who are weary, those who are troubled in any way. We pray that they might be restored to wholeness of life that you will cover them with your grace and strengthen them in body or mind or spirit. We pray for all those we know in need of your mercy, in need of your healing, in need of your welcome. For those we hold and name now in the silence of our hearts, we pray for those known only to you. Loving God, hear the prayers of your people for the sake of our world and for the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Amen. Mm-hmm. 